What will we find in today's Thursday thrillers here on the Mutual Audio Network? A few baffling mysteries? Perhaps a touch of murder? Let's find out. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. The Mysteries of Dr. John Thorndike. Thorndike is the original fictional forensic detective from the early 1900s, using science to aid the art of detection to bring criminals to justice. This time, presenting The Five Pipe Problem, written by R. Austin Freeman, adapted for radio by Heather Elliott. Here's a delightful morning for a trip to the Lower Thames, isn't it, Dr. Thorndike? Certainly is. Thank you for taking Jervis Poulton and me down to Blackwell Point, Captain Grumpus. Anything I can help you with. You did me a good service a while back. Say, Poulton, what's this thing you've invented to put us out of work? Oh, it's an improved prism for increasing the efficiency of the gaslit boys. Anything to cut down the number of outages along the boy lines is something worth looking at. Nice state of things when nautical experts have got to be taught their business by a parcel of lawyers or doctors. I suppose the trade's slack and idle hands and all. Well, there isn't much going on the civil side, but the criminals are still going strong. Ah, mystery department's still flourishing? And by Jove, talking about mysteries, Doctor, our people have got a problem to work out. Something quite in your line of work. Since I've got you here, why shouldn't I suck your brains on it? Exactly, why shouldn't you? Well then, I will. The mystery shortly stated is this. One of our lighthousemen has disappeared vanished off the face of the earth and left no trace. He may have bolted, he may have been drowned accidentally, or he may have been murdered. Well, how did you discover he was missing? At the end of last week, a barge into Ramsgate brought us a letter from the screw pile lighthouse on the girdler. There's only two men stationed there, and it seems that one of them, Barnett, had broken his leg. His letter asked that we send out the tender to bring him ashore. Did you? The local tender was up on the slip having a scrape down and wouldn't be available for two days. Since the case was urgent, the officer at Ramsgate sent a message back saying they'd send another man over by boat in the morning. When was this? Saturday morning. We had a new man just taken on, a man named James Brown who was lodging near Rick Holver and waiting his turn. The Ramsgate officer sent a letter down telling him to go out on Saturday morning in the Coast Guard's boat. The Ramsgate officer then sent a third letter to the Coast Guard at Reculver asking him to take Brown out to the lighthouse and bring Barnett ashore. Sounds like a mess in the making. Between them all, they made a fine muddle of it. The Coast Guard couldn't spare either a boat or man, so they borrowed a fisherman's boat. In this, Brown started off alone like an idiot on the chance that Barnett would be able to sail the boat back in spite of his broken leg. I suspect there's more to this story. Meanwhile, Barnett signaled a collier bound for his home port of Whitstable and got taken off. That left the other keeper, Thomas Jeffries, alone until Brown turned up. But he never did turn up, I presume. No. The Coast Guard helped him put off and the keeper, Jeffries, saw a sailing boat one man in her making for the lighthouse. Then a bank of fog came up and hid the boat. And when the fog had cleared, she was nowhere to be seen. Gone. Vanished. Not a sign. He may have been run down in the fog. He may, but no accident has been reported. The Coast Guard thinks he may have capsized in a small squall, except there weren't any squall. Was he all right and well when he put off, Captain? Yes. Coast Guard's report is full of silly details that have no bearing on anything. Listen, when last seen, the missing man was seated in the boat's stern to windward of the helm. He had belayed the sheet, he was holding a pipe and tobacco pouch in his hands and steering with his elbow, he was filling the pipe from the tobacco pouch. There, he was holding the pipe in his hand, marking not with his toes, and he was refilling it from a tobacco pouch, whereas you'd have expected him to fill it from a feeding bottle. Bah! (laughs) You're hardly fair to the Coast Guard, Captain. The duty of the witness is to give all of the facts, not a selection. What the deuce can it matter what he filled his pipe from? 
who can say? It may turn out to be highly material fact. One never knows beforehand. The value of a particular fact depends on its relation to the rest of the evidence. I suppose it does. Look ahead! Now what the deuce that steam troller be doing alongside our wharf? They seem to be landing something, too. Pass me those field glasses, Polton. Here you are, Captain. Why, hang me! It's a dead body! What's this about? They must have known you were coming, Doctor. What's this about? It's one of your Trinity House men, sir. We saw the body laying on the edge of the South Shingle Sand, close to the beacon. So we put a boat off and fetched it aboard. There was nothing to identify the man by, so I had to look in his pockets and found this letter. Hmm. Addressed to Mr. J. Brown, care of Mr. Solly, Shepard Reculver Kent. This is the man we're speaking about, Doctor. A singular coincidence. Well, you'll have to write to the coroner to come out. Uh, by the way, did you turn out all the pockets? No, sir. I found the letter in the first pocket, so I didn't examine any of the others. Is there anything more you want to know, sir? Uh, nothing but your own name and address, thank you. Dr. Thorndock, I wonder if you would mind having a look at the body while Polton is showing us his new prism contraption. I can't do much without a coroner's order, but if it will give you any satisfaction, Jervis and I will make a preliminary inspection. We'd be glad to know how he met his end. Might explain his disappearance. There's an unused shed by our building. I'll have my men move in there for the coroner. I'll take the notes, if you would prefer. There's not much room in here for us both to examine him. Uh, please do that, Jervis. A small, elderly man, decently dressed in somewhat nautical fashion, appears to have been dead for two to three days. Note the lack of injuries from fish and crabs common on seaborne corpses. You have all that, Jervis? Seaborne corpses? Yes, I uh, never thought I'd use Greg shorthand this much after leaving university. <laughs> as long as it's legible. Uh, now, there appears to be no fractured bones, no wounds, except for this rugged tear in the scalp at the back of the head. The general appearance of the body suggests drowning, except for that scalp wound. It seems to have been an oblique blow, obviously inflicted during life, that spent its force on the scalp, leaving the skull uninjured. Noted. Not the cause of death. It is significant in another way. This man set off for the lighthouse, but never arrived. Where did he arrive? Uh, here, look, at these white objects among the hairs and inside the wound. They seem to be bits of shells and... and tubes of some marine wool. Yes, the broken shells are evidently those of the acorn barnacle, and the other fragments are mostly pieces of the tubes of the common serpula. This implies that the wound was caused by some body encrusted by acorn barnacles and serpuli. That is to say, something periodically submerged. Is there anything else you wanted me to take note of? Well, we might as well see what's in his pockets, though it's not likely robbery had anything to do with his death. Hardly. I can see his watch in his pocket. Quite a good silver one. Looks like it stopped at 1213. Make sure you jot that down. It might be important. But we'd better examine the pockets one at a time and put the things back when we've looked at them. I've seen Polton off with my men for his experiment. I gather you're finished up here? We can't get much farther in the case without a post-mortem. Is there anything, Doctor, that throws any light on the man's disappearance? There are one or two curious features in the case, but oddly enough, the only really important point arises out of that statement of the Coast Guard. You don't say! Yes, the Coast Guard states that when last seen, the deceased was filling his pipe from his tobacco pouch. We've examined his pouch, and it contains dark, fine-cut shag tobacco. But the pipe in his pocket was stuffed with black, coarsely cut shavings. From a cake of tobacco. There's not a cake tobacco in any of his pockets. Not a fragment. It is possible that he might have used it all up to fill the pipe, but there was no trace of any on the blade of his pocket knife. His sheath knife was missing, but would hardly have been used to shred tobacco when a pocket knife was present. No, but you are sure there wasn't a second pipe? There was only one pipe, and that was not even his. Not his? How do you know it's not his? The mouthpiece has deep tooth marks. In fact, it was nearly bitten through. Now, a man who bites through his pipe usually presents certain features, namely a fairly good set of teeth. The dead man hasn't got a tooth in his head. I don't quite see the bearing of it. Don't you? Well, it seems to be highly suggestive. Here's a man who, when last seen, was filling his pipe with a particular kind of tobacco. He's picked up dead, 
and his pipe contains a totally different kind of tobacco. Now, where did that tobacco come from? The obvious suggestion is that he had met someone. Yes, it does look like it. Then there's his missing sheath knife. That may mean nothing, but we have to bear it in mind. There is another curious circumstance. We found a wound on the back of his head caused by a heavy bump against some body that was covered in acorn bottles and marine worms. Now there are no piers or stages out in the open estuary. The question is, what could he have struck? Oh, there is nothing in that. When a body has been washing about in Tideway for close on three days... There's not a question about the body, Captain. The wound was made while he was still alive. The deuce it was! Well, all I can suggest is that he must have fouled one of the beacons in the fog, stove in his boat, and bumped his head. Though I must admit, that's a rather lame suggestion. That's our conclusion, without more information. I'm going down on the tender today to make inquiries on the spot. What do you say to coming with me as advisor? You and Dr. Jervis? I start out around 11 and will be at the lighthouse by 3 o'clock. You can get back to town tonight if you want. What do you say? There's nothing to hinder us. It's a perfect day for being out on the water. (laughs) Very well, we will come along. Jervis is clearly hankering for a sea trip, and so am I for that matter. It's a business engagement, you know. Oh, nothing of the kind, Captain. It's unmitigated pleasure. We should be able to see the lighthouse up ahead, out there in the water. That gangly-looking pile of metal legs and arms with a cabin on top? She ain't a pretty thing, that's for sure. Looks more like the tripod monsters from War of the Worlds. You've read Wells? Is that where my copy disappeared to? Uh, I'll return it when I'm finished analyzing the story. Analyzing a knob? Really, Doctor, you should have other enjoyments than just books and murdicates. <laughs> Such as an afternoon cruise down the Thames? In fact, screw-pile lighthouses combat the sea. If you were to build a traditional lighthouse with a solid foundation, the tides here would wash the silt right out from underneath, collapsing it. Those nine iron support beams are sunk down into the silt, and the lighthouse cabin sits over 40 feet above low tide, allowing the waves to pass through underneath with little resistance. Why is it red? You can see it from here, now can't you? We should be reaching it soon. I spoke to the master of this tender. He's putting us off at the lighthouse and continuing down to the northeast bandstand to replace an old buoy. He'll come back for us when they're finished the job. Here we are. We can have a rope tossed down from that green case of yours, Doctor. Thank you, but I'd rather carry it myself. Delicate equipment inside. Tall climb, isn't it? Messy, too. Tide's going out, so there's 15 feet of piles and ladders right there, covered in seagrass, barnacles, and worm tubes. Step carefully now. Slippery stuff. Uh, take a look, barnacles and worm tubes, Jervis. Coming up, fellas! We've had steeper, slipperier climbs and worse lighting. Though not as dirty. The stuff will all wipe off. Afternoon, Captain. These gentlemen and I have come to make inquiries about the missing man, James Brown. Which of you is Jeffrey? I am, sir. What have you done to your left hand there? Wrapped up in a bandage. Uh, cut it peeling some potatoes. It, it isn't much of a cut, sir. Well, Jeffries, Brown's body's been picked up and I want particulars for the inquest. You'll be summoned for the inquest, I suppose. So come inside and tell us all you know. I'll be getting back to work if you need me. Yes, of course. Have a seat at the table, Jeffries. Start by telling us what you saw Saturday morning. I'd seen a boat with one man in it making for the lighthouse. Then the fog drifted in and I lost sight. I started the foghorn and kept a bright lookout, but the boat never arrived. I suppose he must have missed the lighthouse and been carried away on the ebb tide. It was running strong at the time. What time was it when you last saw the boat? About half past eleven. What was the man like? I don't know, sir. He... He was rowing and his back was toward me. Did he have any kit bag or chest with him? He'd got his chest with him. What sort of chest was it? Small one, painted green with rope beckets. Was it corded? It had a single cord round holding down the lid. And where is it stowed, Jeffries? In the stern sheets, sir. How far off was the boat when you last saw it? About a half mile. 
Half a mile? Why, how the deuce could you see that chest half a mile away? I was watching the boat through the telescope glass, sir. I see. Well, that will do, Jeffries. Tell Smith I want to see him. You men seem to be inveterate smokers. We do like a bit of backy, sir. And that's a fact. You see, sir, it's a lonely life and tobacco's cheap out here. Mm, how's that? We get it given to us. A small craft from foreign ports, especially the Dutchmen, generally heave us a cake or two when they pass close. We're not ashore, you see, so there's no duty to pay. So you don't trouble the tobacco stores much, eh? Don't go in for cut tobacco? No, sir. We'd have to buy that, and the cut stuff wouldn't keep anyway. Nope, it's hard tack to eat out here, and hard tobacco to smoke. I see you've got a pipe rack, too. Quite a stylish affair. Thank you, sir. I made it in my off time. Keeps the place tidy and looks more ship-shaped than letting the pipes lie around anywhere. Someone seems to have neglected his pipe. It's coated with mildew. Uh, that's Parsons, my mate. He must have left it when he went off near a month ago. Pipes do go moldy in the damp air out here. Tell me, Smith, how soon does a pipe go moldy if it's left untouched? It's according to the weather, you see, sir. When it's warm and damp, they'll begin to go in about a week. Now here's Barnett's pipe that he left behind. The man who broke his leg, you know, sir. It's just beginning to spot a little. He couldn't have used it for a day or two before he went. Are all these other pipes yours? No, sir. This here is mine. The end one is Jeffrey's, and I suppose the middle one is his, too. I don't recall seeing him use it. You're a demon for pipes, Doctor. You seem to make a special study of them. Ah, the proper study of mankind is man, and that includes those objects on which his personality is impressed. A pipe is a very personal thing. Look at that row in the rack. Each has its own appearance that reflects the peculiarities of the owner. Tell us what you observed, Jervis. Well, Jeffrey's pipe at the end has a uh, mouthpiece nearly bitten through. The bowl scraped to a shell and scored inside, and the brim is battered and chipped. The whole thing speaks of rude strength and rough handling. He chews the stem as he smokes, scrapes the bowl violently, and bangs the ashes out with unnecessary force. Yes, I see what you're going at, Dr... Uh, Thorndike, Dr. Thorndike. The man fits the pipe exactly, Dr. Thorndike. Powerful, square-jawed, violent on occasion. He's a tough one, Jeffries is. What do you make of mine? <laughs> Coked up until the cavity is nearly filled and burnt all around the edge. A talker's pipe, constantly going out and being relit. <laughs> well, I'll be damned. Excuse me, gentlemen. Need to be getting back to work. It's that pipe in the middle that puzzles me. Didn't Smith say it belonged to Jeffries? Yes, but he must be mistaken. It's the very opposite in every respect. Look closer, Jervis. While it may be an old pipe, there's not a sign of any tooth marks on the mouthpiece. It's the only one in the rack that is unmarked. The brim is quite uninjured. It's been handled gently, you mean? Incidentally, it's full of tobacco. What moral do you draw from that? The moral is that you should see that your pipe is clear before you fill it. Look at the mouthpiece. The bore is completely stopped up with fine fluff. If you'll excuse me a minute, I'll just go and see what the tender is up to. She seems to be crossing to the east girdler. Hand me that telescope from the wall beside you, would you, Dr. Jervis? Jervis, let me see that mystery pipe. Why are you scraping out the... Bye. Jove, it's shack tobacco. Well, yes, but didn't you expect it to be? I don't know that I expected anything. Let us see what the obstruction in the bore consists of. Would you uh, set the microscope up while I prepare a slide? Of course. Here's your slide. The glycerin, uh, cover glass, and tweezers. Uh, no, no, a needle will do fine, thank you. Do you want the pipe left out? Uh, best to put it away. Hmm, most interesting. Uh, take a look, Jervis. Tell me what your learned opinion is of that fluff found in the pipe. Cotton fiber? Some wool? Is that hair? A small animal, but not a mouse or a rat, or, or any rodent. Some small insectivorous animal, I fancy. Yes, of course. Mole hair. Brown had a mole skin pouch in his pocket. Yes, the hairs are unmistakable in their appearance. And they furnish the keystone of the argument. You really think this is the dead man's pipe? Well, according to the law of multiple evidence, it's practically a certainty. Consider the facts in sequence. There are no signs of mildew, so this pipe can only have been here a short time. The only men that have been here are Barnett, Smith, Jeffries, or Brown. We know it's an old pipe with no tooth marks. 
But Barnett, Smith, and Jeffries all have teeth and mark their pipes, while Brown has no teeth. The tobacco in it is shag, but these three men do not smoke shag. Whereas Brown had shag in his pouch. We also just found mole hair in the bore of the pipe, and Brown carried a mole skin pouch in his pocket in which he appears to have kept his pipe. Finally, Brown's pocket contained a pipe which was obviously not his, and which closely resembles that of Jeffrey's. It contained tobacco similar to that which Jeffrey smokes, and different from that in Brown's pouch. It appears to me quite conclusive. In light of other evidence in our possession, Jervis. What else do we have? The dead man knocked his head heavily against some periodically submerged body covered with acorn barnacles and serpuli. And the piles of this lighthouse answer that description exactly. There's nothing else in the neighborhood that will do it. Even the beacons are too large for that size wound. Then the dead man's knife sheath is missing and Jeffries has a knife wound on his left hand. I must admit, the circumstantial evidence is overwhelming. The tender is coming up towing a strange boat. I expect it's the missing one, and if it is, we may learn something. Ho there. Is that the missing boat? Yes, sir. We saw her lying on the dry patch at the East Girdler. There's been some hanky-panky in this job, sir. Foul play, you think, huh? Not a doubt of it, sir. The plug was out and lying loose in the bottom, and we found a sheath knife sticking into the kelson forward among the coils of the painter. It was stuck in hard, as if it had been dropped from a height. That's odd. As to the plug, it might have gotten out by accident. Not a chance, sir. The ballast bags have been shifted along to get at it. Besides, sir, a seaman wouldn't let the boat fill. He'd have put the plug back in and bailed out. That's true. And the presence of the knife looks fishy. But where the deuce could it have dropped from? Out in the open sea. Knives don't drop from clouds, fortunately. What do you make of it, doctors? I should say it's Brown's knife, and that it probably fell right here from this platform of the lighthouse. What do you mean? Haven't I said the boat never came here? You have, but if that is so, kindly explain the fact that your pipe was found in the dead man's pocket, and the dead man's pipe is sitting right there in Smith's pipe rack. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'll relate what happened, and you can check my statements for accuracy. That's crazy. I'm interested to hear the good doctor. As am I. Brown brought his boat alongside and came up into the living room, bringing his chest with him. He filled his pipe and tried to light it, but it was stopped up and wouldn't draw. Then you lent him a pipe of yours and filled it for him. Soon afterwards, you came out on this observation platform and quarreled. Brown defended himself with his knife, which dropped from his hand into the boat. You pushed him off the platform and he fell, knocking his head on one of the piles. You took the plug out of the boat and sent her adrift to sink, and you flung Brown's chest into the sea. Astounding. Incidentally, this happened about ten minutes past twelve. Am I right? Well, I'll be damned. Am I right, Jeffries? Strike me blind. Was you here then? You talk as if you had been. Anyhow, you seem to know all about it. But you're wrong about one thing. There was no quarrel. This chap Brown didn't take to me, and he didn't mean to stay out here. He was going to put off and go ashore again, and I wouldn't let him. Then he hit out at me with his knife, and I knocked it out of his hand, and he staggered backwards and went overboard. And did you try to pick him up? How could I? With the tide racing down and me alone on the station, I'd never got back here. But what about the boat, Jeffries? Why'd you scuttle her? Uh, the fact is, I, I got in a funk, and I, I, I thought the simplest plan was to send her to the cellar and know nothing about it. But I never shoved him over. It was an accident, sir, I swear. Well, that sounds a reasonable explanation. What do you say, Dr. Thorndike? Perfectly reasonable. As to the truth of it, it's no affair of ours. No, but I shall have to take you off the lighthouse, Jeffries, and hand you over to the police. You understand that? Yes, sir. I understand. Glad you could join me for lunch, Doctor. I was pleased to get your invitation. How are things out on the water? Winter is a far different beast from the other seasons. Keeps us on our toes. Is Dr. Jervis meeting us later? I sent him an invitation as well. No, he's away on his honeymoon. You don't say. He married a sweet girl that he met on his first case with me. Another one of your mysteries, I suppose. A ah, very interesting one. Speaking of mysteries, that was an odd affair we had back on the girdler a few months ago. Pretty easy let off for Jeffries, too. Eighteen months imprisonment, wasn't it? There was something behind that accident with Brown, I should say. Those men had met before. I'm certain of it. That's the impression I had. 
but the strangest part is how you nosed it all out. I've had a deep respect for Briar Pipe since then. Remarkable. It's all in the facts and knowledge of men. The way you made that pipe tell the story of the murder seems to me like sheer enchantment. There's a German folk story about a magic pipe, only it wasn't a smoking pipe. The singing bone, I believe. Do you remember it? A peasant found the bone of a murdered man and fashioned it into a pipe. A bit morbid. But aren't most German folk stories? When the fella tried to play on the pipe, it burst into a song of its own. My brother slew me and hurry, buried my bones beneath the sand and under the stones. It has an excellent moral. What's that? The inanimate things around us have each of them a song to sing if we are but ready to listen with attentive ears. Well said, Doctor. Well said. To the singing bone, tobacco pipe, and anything else that tells a tale. The Mysteries of Dr. John Thorndike, written by R. Austin Freeman, adapted for radio by Heather Elliott. Starring Dave Johnson as Dr. John Thorndike, and Roy Nessel as Dr. Christopher Jervis. Also in the cast were Jim Galan as Captain Grumpus, Bob Helling as Thomas Jeffries, Will Crow as Alvin Smith, Daryl Moffat as Tender Crewmate, Dave Anderson as Poulton, James Anderson as Trawler Captain. I'm your announcer, Ryan Barker. Sound design and dialogue editing, Jay Charles. Recording engineer, Jim Galan. Recording technician, Bobby Wiley. Directed by Steve Chambers. Produced by Joseph C. McGuire. Recorded in partnership at KSVR Studios in Mount Vernon, Washington. This was a Radio Theater Project presentation.